Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a teaching that I started last Monday. We're talking about Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword. That's the title that I've given to this new book that we've got out. And I am really excited about this book. I'd really like to encourage you to get it because it's basically a compilation of 16 different books that I've written. Each chapter deals with an entire book. It's a summary of a book. So it's just a capsule type uh, teaching on that. It doesn't go into the same depth, but I tell you, it's powerful just to get all of these things put together. Uh, it would really be a great way to introduce a person to this ministry and all of the things that I teach. These aren't all of the books that I've written, but it's some of the major ones, 16 of the major uh, books that I've written, and it really, really would be a blessing to you. So this week, we've already talked about what is true salvation, what distinguishes true Christianity from other religions. We've talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I've talked about spirit, soul, and body, which is the truth that the Lord used that just lit a fire on the inside of me and opened up my understanding. And then a logical extension of this spirit, soul, and body, who you are in the spirit, led into talking about you've already got it, which is another book that I've got out. And that's what I talked about on the program yesterday, that God has already placed everything that we need on the inside of us. And so instead of asking God to heal us or prosper us or bless us, He's already put that power on the inside. And what we've got to do is learn how to release it and activate it, how to open up the valve and let out of us this power and anointing that God has placed on the inside of us. Boy, that is a paradigm shift. Matter of fact, I had one of my students say, that's not a paradigm shift, that's a paraquarter shift. <laughs> and it's huge. And this is uh, just a major, major problem in the body of Christ. What I want to talk about today, and this is impossible to talk about in one time, but I'm going to try it. This is just a really brief summary of the way God dealt with people under the Old Covenant compared to the way he deals with people under the new covenant. And it's major difference. There's a lot of people that all they think the difference is between the old covenant and the new covenant is just one blank page right here. <laughs> they just think it's a separation. But no, the old covenant is an old contract. It's an old way of God dealing with people. And in the old covenant, he punished people. He put sickness and disease on people. He smote people. Uh, he dealt with people based on their performance, and it was all centered around sin and their performance. Under the new covenant, God placed all of his wrath for our sin upon Jesus, and because of that, it's just as if we had never sinned. That's what the word justified means, just as if I had never sinned. And because of that, God treats us differently there is a new way of dealing with us under the new covenant. And because people don't understand this, then they take the harshness and the punishment and the wrath and the rejection of the Old Testament and they just incorporate that into the New Testament and they think that sometimes God will treat you good, sometimes He'll treat you bad. You never know which way it's going to be. But that's not true. The Lord has had His wrath against our sins satisfied through Jesus. And God is never going to punish us the way He punished saints in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 54 verse 9 says He has sworn that He would never be angry with us nor rebuke us again. That is a concept that is just totally foreign to the average person's way of thinking. They think that God is constantly rebuking them and they ascribe to the Holy Spirit this guilt and condemnation that most people feel, and that is not the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He does not do those kind of things to us. So you've got to understand the difference between the Old Testament way that God dealt with us and the New Testament way. So over here in the book of Romans, chapter 5, is a passage of Scripture that um, is one of the very first ones that the Lord used to start giving me revelation about this. And it says in Romans chapter 5, 
and in verse 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now that's just a short verse, and most people read right over that. Probably most of you don't have this underlined in all of these things that we do in our Bible. But that is one profound verse. It says, Until the law... That's talking about the law that was given by God to Moses. This happened nearly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. This word imputed is an accounting type of term. It literally means to record or to put on the books. You know, really, uh, probably a better a uh, comparison for us today would be the way that we use a credit card. When you use a credit card and when you go buy something, you give them their credit card and some of you think, well, I paid for it. No, you didn't pay for anything when you give them your credit card. What you did was give them information so that that transaction could be imputed unto you. In other words, they will take this information and they will send your credit card company a bill saying so-and-so bought this product and it was worth this much and and the credit card company has to pay the retailer and the credit card company will come back to you with a bill a statement and you have to pay that bill if you don't think that that's how it works if you think that you've actually paid for it and that's all you need to do when you give them your credit card just don't pay the credit card bill when it comes and see what happens they will explain to you very quickly that you haven't paid for it yet <laughs> amen all you had it all you did was have it imputed unto you. And this is saying that sin was in the world until the time that the law came. But before the law came, sin was not imputed. That would be just the same as you going and buying something and you want to give them your card. Or maybe let's say that you even gave them your card, but for whatever reason that clerk didn't record the details and it just never gets imputed unto you. It never gets charged to you. I actually had that happen to me. I had a $3,500 bill one time that the person who uh, uh, was our representative at this hotel, this was to pay for a meeting that we held there, uh, they got fired or something. I don't know if it was associated with the way she did things for us or I don't know. But anyway, she got fired and because of it, she never took our information that we gave her and she never uh, ran it through the thing. When they fired her, she just left and that never got charged. And here we were a year later still waiting on all of this bill and we finally contacted the credit card company and said, you know, we charged this, this thing to our bill but it never came through. And they went back, researched it, told us what happened and then we had to pay that bill. But you know what? In a sense, see that it's like that uh, meeting that we held never was imputed unto us. If we hadn't volunteered this information, we didn't even have any liability. This is saying that before the time that the law was given, God wasn't imputing people's sins. He didn't hold their sins against them. Boy, this is a radical truth. And again, this is different than what most people think. Most people have thought that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, here was a holy God with unholy man, God just kicked them out wanted nothing to do with them because holy God could not fellowship with holy man, unholy man. And so there was this rift and there was this great gulf fixed. If you go back and study it, which I haven't got time to do right now, you'll actually find out that God was still walking and talking and speaking audibly to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. He didn't drive them out of his presence. He drove them out of the garden. And it says in Genesis chapter 3 and around verse 22, the reason he drove them out of the garden was so that they wouldn't take of the tree of life and eat it and live forever. It's not because he hated man and didn't want to fellowship with him. He was still fellowshipping and talking with men in the fourth chapter after he had driven them out of the garden. He drove them out of the garden because of love and because of mercy. He didn't want them living forever in a sinful, contaminated body. Some people haven't thought this through and they don't fully appreciate that. But just imagine, if you could, a person who, like, say, for instance, was born mentally retarded, Down syndrome, and yet you couldn't die. You live forever. 
like that. Imagine a person with deformities. Imagine a person like Helen Keller that were, was deaf, deaf and blind. And you had to live forever that way. You couldn't ever be, be over that. You know, the Lord provided something better for us. Death is never God's original plan, but since corruption entered into the world and corruption's entered into our body, it's actually better for us to die and have a resurrected body that'll be uh, free from all of the shackles and the chains of this physical life and will be just perfected. There is something better. And that's the reason that God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, not because he didn't want a fellowship with them, but he didn't want them living forever in this sinful condition. And it was men that walked away from God. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 16, I believe it is, it says Cain left the presence of God. God didn't kick Cain out of his presence. Cain left the presence of God. And ever since then, mankind has been walking away from the presence of God. But during that time, in between the fall of man and the giving of the law, God was being merciful unto man's sins. And again, if I had more time, if you want to get this entire teaching, it would go into a lot more detail. But Abraham is a man who married his half-sister, which according to Leviticus chapter 18 is an abomination in the sight of God. You had to put a person who married a half-sister to death, and if you didn't kill them, you could be stoned to death. And yet this man, Abram, who married his half-sister, was not only not punished by God, but he was blessed by God. He's the only person in the Old Covenant that God called a friend of God. That's pretty powerful. God wasn't imputing that sin unto him. And then Abraham's uh, son came along, and he did a lot of things wrong too. Then his grandson came along, Jacob, and Jacob married two sisters. And Leviticus 18 says that if you marry a sister while the first sister is still alive, if you have two sisters that are your wife, then it's an abomination. You have to stone that person to death. This person not only was not stoned, but he wrestled with an angel of God and prevailed, and God blessed him and changed his name from Jacob to Israel, and he became the father of all of the Israelites. And you can see God's blessing being on people. That's not to say that God approved of sin, but God wasn't punishing and hurting them because of sin. He was trying to draw mankind unto himself through mercy and through being kind unto them and not imputing, holding their sins against them. But men began to take God's lack of punishment as approval. And you can see Cain's great-great-grandson, Lamech, who killed a man. And Lamech came out and said, if God is going to avenge Cain sevenfold, he'll avenge Lamech seventy and sevenfold. In other words, Lamech thought that his murder in self-defense was more justified than Cain's. And since God didn't punish Cain, but instead put a mark on him so that nobody else would execute judgment, if he extended mercy towards the first murderer on the face of the earth, then Lamech said, surely he's going to avenge me seventy and sevenfold. But see, that was wrong. What he was doing, he was comparing himself among himself and thinking, you know what, I, I'm not as bad as Cain, and so God is certainly going to accept me. He wasn't going before God in a repentant attitude and humbling himself. What he was doing was comparing himself and saying, this guy got by with murder, so I think I can get by with murder. And so because of this, people begin to lose their perspective on what was right and wrong. Same thing still happens to us today. You know, when I was a kid, homosexuality was wrong by anybody's standards. There was homosexuals when I was a kid, but nobody bragged about it. Nobody had a parade about it. Nobody made you feel bad if you thought that homosexuality wasn't the right thing to do. But you know what? Over uh, just one generation, just a few years, everything is changing because they, people are comparing themselves among themselves, and they're thinking, well, this person, you know... Um, I won't mention names, but this movie star who was at one time, people thought just one of the most macho guys and this great movie star, turns out he was homosexual and, you know, he was still famous and he was still liked by people and pretty soon you've just got a totally different attitude and people are changing. Does that mean that God's standard have changed? No, people, they were comparing themselves and so they were thinking, well, murder's okay. And so people were living such an ungodly lifestyle 
that if God hadn't have done something to put his fear back in people and restrain the amount of sin, there literally would not have been a virgin left for Jesus to have come into this earth through. I mean, it was getting that bad. Immorality was so bad. And so God gave the law. And by giving the law, he immediately took away this deception of thinking, well, this person got by with it, so I'll get by. Well, all of a sudden, they quit comparing themselves among themselves. Now, here was God's standard. Here's God saying, this is right, this is wrong, and it made their conscience come back to the right center. And also, another benefit of the law is that people were thinking that, you know, they were comparing themselves among themselves and thinking, I'm a pretty good person. I really don't need uh, help the way that this person does because I'm living such a godly life. That's total deception. You know, I already taught on this this week about people who think that they're going to be accepted with God because their good outweighs their bad. But that's not true. And just because you're better than somebody else, who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? You need a Savior. And so God needed this... Uh, understanding about how deadly sin was to come alive on these people and show them that if you have committed even the slightest sin, you have been defiled and therefore you need a Savior. So when he gave the law, it accomplished that. But here's the negative side of the law. You know, in a sense, it's like some of these commercials that you see on television and they say, if you have a headache, take this pill. But then they'll spend 30 seconds giving you all the side effects. Now, this could kill you. It'll increase your risk of a heart attack. It'll make you impotent. It'll make you have... <laughs> and I think, man, give me back my, my headache. I'd rather have the headache than all of these possible consequences. But see, in a sense, the law accomplished some things. It made people's conscience come back, and all of a sudden they realize, whoops, I don't care what our society says. This is what God says. This is right and wrong. And it took away any deception that you could save yourself. It made you realize that if this is God's standard, I've sinned. I've come short. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. Those things were positive. But here's the negatives, that it exposed these people to a wrath and a judgment and a punishment from God that is really not his heart. You know, there's a lot of different scriptures that talk about God and who he is, but I think based on what Jesus had to say and based on other scripture, I believe that the most descriptive scriptures about God are like 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, for God is love. Jesus was the perfect manifestation of God, and he showed mercy and pity. It was God's heart to extend mercy towards people. Like this verse that I was using, it says that for the first 2,000 years, he didn't impute man's sins unto him. He didn't want man to know how bad they were. He didn't want us to have a fear and the wrath of God and all of these things. He wanted love to be the dominant thing. But when men begin to take God's lack of punishment upon sin as approval, then God had to put in place the Old Testament law to restrain the amount of sin and to knock us to our face so that we would recognize we couldn't save ourselves and prepare us for the salvation that would come through Jesus. In a sense, what I did was just summarize Galatians chapter 3. That's what it says. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. But now that faith has come, we aren't under this schoolmaster anymore. And look at this passage of Scripture. Remember the verses that I've already used where it says that until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. And then look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 19. It says, to wit, or that's old English, for to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Remember, Romans chapter 5, verse 13 says, Until the law, that's nearly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve, God didn't impute, didn't register man's sins. He didn't deal with us according to our sins. And now this says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So from the time that Christ came, 
The Lord has not been imputing our trespasses unto us. He's imputed them unto Jesus. Go back to this example I gave about a credit card. And I talked about what happened if you gave them the credit card, but if they didn't uh, impute it, if they took the receipt and threw it away, as happened to me, then it would never have been imputed unto you. An actual better analogy is that here I was having my sins imputed unto me, like put to my credit card, and instead Jesus just intervened and said, no, here, put it on my account. In other words, it's not the fact that your account uh, hasn't been paid, that it's an accounting mistake or something like that. No, God accounted for your sins. But instead of making you pay for your sins, he put all of your sins and my sins upon Jesus, and Jesus paid for our sins. That's a great account. And because of that, now, if, if I was going to buy something and you came up and said, oh, no, put it on my card, and then th they gave, you gave your card instead, well, if they were to send me a bill and make me try and pay for it when you have already paid for it, that's wrong. That's double dipping. That's double jeopardy. You can't do that. You would have recourse to come back and say, no, I will not pay it. This other person has already paid it. Well, Jesus has already paid for my sins, and because of it, now God treats me just as if I'd never sinned. He's not imputing my sins unto me. So we've been approximately 6,000 years since the fall of Adam and Eve, recorded history. The first 2,000 years, God wasn't imputing man's sins unto them. Then for 2,000 years until the time of Christ, he did impute man's sins unto them under the law, and now, since the time of Christ until this time, which is approximately 2,000 years, he has not been imputing our sins unto us. So out of 6,000 recorded years of history, we have only 2,000 years where he imputed man's sins unto them, and yet most Christians still believe that God is dealing with them according to their sins. When you do well, God will treat you well. When you do bad, God will treat you badly. That's because they don't understand that there is an end of the Old Testament law. They are living under a system that was only temporary. Galatians 3 said it was only given until Christ should come. And now that Christ has come, the law has been removed. We are no longer serving God under the law. And you should not have any sin consciousness that goes along with failure to live up to some standard. Does this mean that you now are free to just go live in sin? It means that God's paid for your sins, and in a sense, I guess you could go do that. But if you've been truly born again, you don't want to do it. Your heart's been changed, and you're just absolutely stupid if you go live in sin. Because there's consequences still. Even though God may not impute it, even though you may not lose your relationship with God, you're going to give Satan an inroad into your life, and that's just stupid. But I'm saying God loves you, stupid. Amen. God's not withdrawing from you. He placed all of our punishment upon Jesus. That is a very brief summary of a big teaching that I have entitled The True Nature of God. And that's just one chapter out of this book entitled Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword. I encourage you to listen to our announcer as he gives you some information about how you can get this brand new book. And please call or write today. Andrew's newest book titled Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword is available for £8.50. This book is unlike any other Andrew has ever written. Rather than one topic, it contains 16 of Andrew's most powerful teachings. Each is condensed into a single chapter, making this the most comprehensive collection of life-changing messages we've ever offered. Contact us today to get your copy. Or if you prefer, you can order Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword on DVD as seen on TV. This series has over seven hours of life-changing teaching. The entire DVD series is available for 13 pounds. There's also a new Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword workbook available for 17 pounds 50. The workbook works well in conjunction with the DVD series offering the opportunity for deeper study of the biblical principles Andrew presents in his teaching. Or you can get all three of these products by ordering the Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword package. This package includes the brand new book, the As Seen on TV DVD series, and the workbook. 
The entire package has a catalog value of 39 pounds. But today, you can get the sharper than a two-edged sword package for just 34 pounds. A single DVD containing the first week's broadcast of this series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this first DVD free of charge. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Warwickshire, England for the Grace and Faith Family Camp May 27th through the 30th and in Colorado Springs, Colorado for the Summer Family Bible Conference July 4th through the 8th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. Have you ever wanted to check out back issues of Gospel Truth Magazine from Andrew Womack Ministries? They're available online at awmi.net. Just log on to our website, look to the left, and click on Extras. Then look to the left again and click on Online Magazines. Once you're there, you're free to browse through our selection of Gospel Truth magazines from years past. Check out some great articles, and be sure and check out the current issue while you're at it. Gospel Truth Magazine, now available online at awmi.net. She was a, a grayish white color. And she was still. And she had all these waters coming in and out of her. She was just, she was laid out on a table to be ready to be transported. When I got into the car to follow the ambulance over to UAB, I had my quiet moment. And I was just praying out, God, I know your will in her life. I know you want to heal. It's your will to heal. God wants you well. That kept coming back to my mind. And then the doctor said um, the heart did not develop. We run echograms. We only see a very small left side of her heart. And um, if it hadn't been for what Andrew had, had, had revealed to me in his teaching, I couldn't have held on to that. I would have sp spoke death. I would have uh, I've let go of that faith. And this was the time. Catch the complete story today. Log on to awmi.net. Click on Ministry News and take a healing journey today.